Right, after the classic logistics stuff, which is on its way, uh, our next speaker from Australia, Paul, from the University of Melbourne. As Nicholas said, I'm Paul Bone. I'm working towards my PhD at the University of Melbourne. I'm sponsored by the Australian government and NICTA. So they enable me to do cool stuff with parallelism, which is a really awesome job. So, um, and I've been working in Mercury, which is even a lesser known language than Haskell. So we've got some information about Mercury, but essentially it's pure, like Haskell is, although we manage IO a bit differently. We don't have the whole monads thing, um, which some people prefer. Sorry, some people prefer not having monads because they're a difficult concept. Um, Sorry for the interruption, but can we leave the social stuff afterwards? Cool. Thanks. No, it's not for you, it's for yeah, someone I that I can see. <laughs> In other words, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> All right. So, but unlike Haskell, it's eagerly evaluated. So we don't have lazy evaluation, so you can't build up an infinite data structure, but we don't mind. So it means that you can more reasonably uh, know how your, how your program will be evaluated so, and have a few uh, less, fewer costs at runtime. But essentially, as uh, Stephen said, the purity gives you more code reliability. Um, you don't have to, um, you don't, you don't have to be concerned with what's going on in other threads or, or the order of computations. And this allows the compiler to reorder code better. So to, to avoid this. So I've got to start my timer. OK. Um, and we all know parallelism is tricky. That's why we're all here. So. But um, some of the more trickier things, again, as Stephen said, um, are managing synchronization. Now, we've solved this with Purity, and Stephen's shown us that, so I'm not going to talk much about that. But what is also hard is deciding how to parallelize something. Um, and Stephen testified, it's, it's difficult to do that. It requires a fair amount of trial and error. So um, there are other com complications, say, when your program changes, maybe, or it's fed some different data, how does it then run uh, optimally in parallel? So I am to address some of these. Um, and it's, it's my hypothesis that um, humans aren't very good at this and are never going to be great at it. Your average program is not going to be good. So I'd prefer the compiler to handle this, just the way that we use compilers to generate machine code. Nobody writes a machine code or assembly code now, unless they're weird. So, um, so it, I believe it's a completely rational decision. So we do this um, by... Uh, the way a programmer might do this, and we'd recommend them to do it, is to profile their program and look at where the expensive code is and try and find code that's also expensive within that. Um, and then parallelize, determine if that code is independent, it can be parallelized against uh, other code that's also expensive, and then actually annotate the program. And in Mercury, we use another little annotation that's like um, the one we saw in Stephen's slide, um, except it's a little ampersand, and we'll see that shortly. So, but instead I'd prefer the compiler to do this. And the compiler won't have to rerun the program and test to see if it actually worked. The compiler can track using the profiling information about how expensive things are, whether they're going to be faster and calculate the speed up that it's going to get due to parallelism. It can also keep the track of how many cores it thinks you've got that are free. Because when you say, parallelize my program for a roughly eight core machine, um, it can find you roughly eight things to do at once. Um, so, yeah, we do that with an analysis. I don't know if I'm pointing at the right spot. It's not going to work. Um, we do that with an analysis tool that provides feedback, which can be fed back into the compiler 
when recompiling the sources for parallel execution, just as we'd recompile for a debugging build or a profiling build. So we recompile for a um, for a parallel build. Uh, so, but that means that you're not changing the source code at all. So here's some benchmarks from an early implementation. So this program existed and before I tried to parallelize it. So it's a ray tracer. Um, and it uses quite a lot of garbage collection. And parallel garbage collection has been disabled for this benchmark so that, so that we measure only the benefit of parallel evaluation. So when we enable parallel garbage collection, it's uh, much more flattering. So in um, the case labeled with S is the sequential version. It's not thread safe and uses only one core and doesn't bother with any thread safe operations and it builds the garbage collector in a, in a non-thread safe uh, configuration. So, and the case, I've got cases for one processor, three to four processors. This is tested on an Intel Core, uh, two, core 2 quad machine. So it does achieve parallelization, like it does make the program run faster, but it's not wonderful. Um, but even though this is a several thousand line project with multiple modules, it finds the correct place to parallelize in it. It's where I would have put the parallel annotation if I knew the code. So, um, which to me means that it's doing the sensible thing. I wrote another example to try and debunk the ideas about the garbage collector because I really did. So, you see, I've written that um, this uses quite a lot of garbage collection. So, when we use less garbage collection, because I'm not building up tuples of three elements to represent points in space and object and um, things like that, um, we it, it runs much better. And in fact, this is quite a, uh, a lot better because if we divide the score for the sequential version by four, we get a number that's greater than the full processor version, um, which I was shocked by and reran the tests that it came out the same again. In fact, I got the exact same numbers again after I'd rounded off the decimal places. Um, um, I think I've got a couple of ideas. One thing that we're doing when we parallelize code um, that has a certain pattern is that we're reordering code so as more expensive things are run. So as we fork, the thing that gets forked off to run on a different thread is the smaller thing rather than the larger thing. And this avoids a case when the, when the context would otherwise have to block and wait for something to complete. So locking happens less often and we use much less stack space. So without this transformation, this doesn't, like it just thrashes and runs my four gig machine out of memory. Um, but with it, it works really well. So it's just a simple swapping of two calls. And I found that it even improves the performance of the sequential version. Um, the other thing that's happening is that when the garbage collector stops the world to do a collection, It'll stop the world on all of the threads, and then only use the first thread, so the the first thread uh, to to actually do the marking, which means that the remaining three threads cache won't be trashed. So they've still got hot objects in their cache for when they resume from um, from the uh, stop the world. So yeah. and. Um, for your interest, we're using the Bohm garbage collector, with, um, and it's designed to run in an uncooperative environment. So usually some C code um, that does is not written to use garbage collection. It's designed as a drop-in replacement for malloc, um, and it stops the world in a very, um, in my mind, inefficient way. It sends a signal to the process to every thread in the process, and then blocks the process in the signal handler, waiting for another, and then um, uses another signal to wake it out from the signal, signal handler in order to resume it. It's, I don't like it. 
So I'd much rather something a bit more elegant that the Haskell guys are using. I like this a bit better. So I've shown some simple cases where we achieve parallelism, but I'd like to discuss some more complicated cases that we plan to handle in the very near future. I and mean, I'll probably implement these in the next six months. This is the quicksort algorithm. I trust everybody knows the quicksort algorithm or has seen or heard of it before. Um, simply, quicksort petitions the list around a pivot item, um, producing a list of big elements and a list of small elements, and then sorts each of those um, before appending the lists with the uh, pivot element back together to return the result. Um, the very easy way to parallelize this is to operate the two recursive quicksort calls in parallel. Uh, this is naive. Um, the, here you can see this is the annotation for parallel evaluation, the ampersand symbol. Um, it's, um, it's, a, it's the conjunction operator in Mercury. Uh, the sequential conjunction operator is the comma, and it's at the end of this first line here. I don't want to have to discuss what a conjunction is. Um, basically, Mercury comes from the world of logic programming, um, but I don't want to mention Prolog, because otherwise I have to tell you why it's different, but I just did. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please don't ask questions about that. It'll take an hour. Okay, that's what I wanted to avoid is the questions. <laughs> so, or, yeah, or the stigma. <laughs> so, the, um, so if we parallelize quicksort like this, it means that in every non-recursive uh, node in the call graph, sorry, in every recursive node in the call graph, that's every node that's not a length, um, we're doing a fork operation. This is too many. This is way too many. If I've got four processes in my standard desktop system, or maybe eight in the near future, um, I don't need a million little tasks to sort a tree of a million items, sorry, a list of a million items. I'd much rather have one, um, like roughly four uh, evenly sized uh, units of work. And this means I'm doing less management of uh, of parallel execution and more actual work. So, and this is something that's important in that you, when you're parallelizing something naively, it's not. It's um, something that's a little tricky to get right. So, what we want to do instead is only perform this transformation where we introduce parallelism near the top of the call tree. So, in this case, we're parallelizing for two processes. Each can have a task that's evenly sized. Um, and we hope they're evenly sized. What we can do is we can parallelize a little bit more just in case our first choice for a pivot is pessimistic and we get an unbalanced tree. But um, by doing something like this, we are handling larger parallel tasks with fewer of them. And in general, that's much more efficient. So I think I'm going too fast. How much time do I have? A minute. Oh, yeah. what? Ten minutes. Okay. I can discuss something else at the end. Okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> so, something else I'd like to do is parallelization, specialization. And apart from being a mouthful, um, I think it's important. If I have, uh, we heard earlier about closures in from James in C++. Or he just said. Lambda, that uh, essentially a I don't want to have to explain that either. <laughs> Do you want to finish now? No, no, I want to keep going. So, so essentially, if Fu um, is performing the same operation over a list of items to transform them into a to transform them into a list of different items, it can pass it the code that does the transformation for a single item, which is represented by a closure. Um, it can pass this into the list map function, which is a general way of doing the same thing to everything in a list and returning a new list. Um, 
So if first closure is expensive, and therefore we'd like to parallelize, like we'd like to speed up Foo's execution because therefore Foo will be expensive, we can parallelize map over lists. But if uh, bars closure is cheap, we don't want to have to parallelize list map because that will actually make bar slower because we're doing too much management of parallel tasks. So in cases like this, what we want to do is take a copy of map over lists transform it to become parallel map, um, and then rewrite foo so it uses parallel map. Um, and that way we're leaving the performance of bar as it is while speeding up foo. Um, since I've got time, oh, just leave it. since I've got time, one of the other transformations I'd like to do is when you can prove that something is associative and cumulative, um, you can execute it in any order, um, even when it updates to shared state. So shared state can be, like, allows us to do things a little bit quicker, which is why we've used it traditionally. Um, but let's say, for an example, addition is both cumulative and associative over integers. Um, what we so it, therefore, it doesn't matter if we do 2 plus 3 or 3 plus 2, or 2 plus 3 and then plus 5, or 2 plus 5 and then plus 3. Um, it doesn't matter what order these operations can occur in. And since we use um, some annotations in the Mercury language to promise associativity and cumulativity to enable some other uh, optimizations, what we what I'd like to be able to do is use this to infer that updates to the state can occur in any order. And if I can also prove that updates to, updates to the state are quick, uh, I can put wrap a lock around the state and then just have multiple threads race to manipulate that state. Um, and the order that they occur in doesn't matter because the programmer has promised that uh, the operations are cumulative and associative, and therefore the result at the end, no matter which order they're applied in, is deterministic. So, um, so I'd like to have a think about other ways of Im improving uh, para uh, the garbage collector. Uh, maybe even I considering replacing the garbage collector. I don't know what with yet. Uh, it's something that hasn't been solved yet. I'd like to see what the Haskell people do. Uh, the, but I'd certainly like to change the way it stops the world because I think that's a performance problem. I didn't mention before, but the ray tracer example, is from what I'm, from what my experience shows, is spending about half its time in the garbage collector doing marking. So, which, which explains why it didn't parallelize nicely in the graph. Um, so I'd like to do other optimizations and transformations to produce more code that can be parallelized a lot more. Um, in the case of the ray tracer, again, I modified it so as that the parallel parallelization analysis uh, would work correctly. Um, I'd like to do those um, transformations automatically. Uh, based on the analysis, and I think that's possible. So, but most of all, the important points I'd like to make are that pure declarative languages make parallel evaluation so much easier, and you don't have to deal with concurrency. You can have concurrency separate to parallel evaluation. Um, and I'd also like to, I'm, I'm advocating that automatic parallel, parallelization it gets a mouthful when you say it so many times, um, is, is worthwhile um, and is possible um, and may or may not be better than an expert, but I think it will be better than most programmers at parallelizing software, especially when everybody's machine is a multi-core machine and we, want to, uh, and we want to take advantage of that for most software. So... Does anybody have any questions 
I'm sure that between prologue and automatic paralyzation, there is at least one skeptic here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I thought First I could. Uh, well yes, done, Paul. Thanks. Thank you. So, skeptic sorry. number one. <laughs> no, at the very Yeah. You could. Now, the dynamic languages people are telling me that they're smarter than me because their languages are interpreted at runtime and they can do all this JIT stuff and and profile their programs. And there's no reason why we can't do that with more static languages, so the ones with static type systems and things. Yeah. I think, I think you're right, and I think that's a good point because it allows you to distribute the same uh, file to users no matter how many cores a user has in their machine, especially if your user uh, has a single core machine and therefore you want to take all the thread safety out because it's just weighing you down. Yeah, that's true. So one thing we do, when we profile the program, at the moment we don't have a way of merging the profiles. Um, so we just we tell users to use your representative workload, um, which means that the program will be, uh, be parallelized specifically to run that workload. Uh, and we hope that that's representative for the use of the program. Yes, there is another question. It was, yes, you? Thank you. Um, yes, I have. <laughs> I'll repeat the question because that's a rather long question. Um, and, um, and, um, and I'm sure the recording would appreciate. Um, the question is that GHC in particular uh, uses very lightweight green threads at runtime and actually runs a number of capabilities. It runs the number of uh, capabilities equal to the number of cores on the system, ideally. Um, so first, the first part of the question is, does Mercury do this? And yes, roughly, except that we call a capability an engine, we call a thread a context, but we call a spark a spark. We've got sparks as well. And we've got work stealing as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, the second part of the question was, Using runtime support for sparks or lightweight engines, sorry, lightweight threads or green threads, um, and making decisions about parallel evaluation at runtime, is that better than uh, doing a transformation like I'd like to with the, with the quick sort? Um, yes and no is the answer. What, uh, what I'd really like to do is after I definitely want to parallelize towards the top of the tree if I believe I've got spare cores available. And all that will do is put sparks on a local spark queue that another context or another engine can steal if it thinks it's idle. Um, then in the middle of the call tree, of the call graph, what I might want to do is do conditional parallelization. If my, spark, if my local Spark queue already has maybe 100 items in it or some threshold of items in it, it's no, there's no point me actually bothering with uh, parallel execution anymore. There's already enough parallel work of a large granularity. So I might as well jump into sequential code and execute that, and that avoids the costs of putting work onto the Spark queues and taking it off again. 
So, and towards the bottom of the tree, you definitely want to just do things sequentially because you'll already have so many, so much work to do. So, yes, we avoid some of the overheads by using lighter weight primitives, but if we can avoid using the lighter weight primitives at all and just go to sequential execution, then that's even better still. There is a final question at the end. Thank you. Not yet. <laughs> so the question is, do we have a cost model for working out com uh, the ratio of communication to computation? Um, I, I'm going to guess at the, at the rationale behind the question, is that when you're distributing work uh, across a bus, or in a, and especially across a network, you want to measure how much data you have to transmit in order to get that work going. If the amount of data you want to transmit is large and the amount of work you're actually going to do is small, even if, even if you could parallelize it, you don't want to because the cost of transferring the data is too great. I would just simply say, okay, that's the yes. Yeah, yes, that, <laughs> that's... Um, it's a language barrier. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's based around the ratio, though, right? Yeah. I think that... So we don't, have, we don't have anything like that in our, in our analysis tool. What I'm considering um, is when a thread wants to steal work from another, from like through work stealing, like taking work off another um, thread's queue, what it should do is look at its neighbor. So if it's a, a thread within the same core, like with hyper-threading, it should look at the, part, at the pair, at the um, other threads in the same core. If it can't find any work there, it should look at the other cores in the same die, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think that that's the best demonstration how efficient this parallelism is because we finished right on time. So, <laughs> guys, I see you in half an hour. We have three fantastic talks. Paul, thank you very much again. Thank you very much, all of you. Feel free to come and chat to me after. And we have a panel, too. Oh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be there. You... <laughs> okay. Thank you.